molar enthalpy. Now, because enthalpy can be easily confused depending on what circumstance it's being used in and the difference between a particular enthalpy versus a general molar enthalpy, we're going to go over the different ways in which you may see it. First one, um, and often how enthalpy is used, is within a thermochemical equation. Um, so within is probably not as common as the next one, but it's basically you treating it as if it were a reactant or a product. And obviously if it's producing energy, it's going to be showing up on the product side as if doing the transformation is what releases the energy. Um, if it is an endothermic reaction, you'll see it on the reactant side. So again, we could take the same reaction. We could rewrite it with the 6.03. Energy is always going to be a positive term, like any other term within a chemical equation, always has to be positive. So if it were to be on the um, reactant side, then we'd be looking at this equation the other way and we'd say, okay, we could take H2O that is a solid, put in 6.03 kilojoules of energy, and then that would turn this H2O into a liquid. Um, so again, like with any equation, it's just an equality. You can flip it if you want, as long as you do so consistently. Just like any other term though, energy would show up if it is within an equation as a positive value. Now, you could have the equation itself written out and then afterwards state what the enthalpy change would be. And in this case, depending on whether it's endo or exothermic, you can write it accordingly. But of course, because you can have exothermic reactions, then you would see the energy term written as a negative because it is not a part of the reaction itself. It's sort of just like an additional bit of information saying, Here's the process here that we're talking about. Oh, and by the way, this is the energy change involved with that particular process. This is probably a little bit more common way of seeing it, a little bit neater and easier to separate from the process itself. Um, and so this is a thermochemical equation with the energy term written afterwards. And again, if it is a exothermic reaction, it's giving off energy, then by doing the process, the system itself has obviously gone down in energy because if it's exothermic, it's releasing energy. So this particular process here, a liquid becoming a solid, would involve going from a liquid state with lots of energy, that's supposed to be a water droplet, um, down to a solid state. And so to do that in terms of energy, you'd be here, and then you go to here. So that's obviously a negative change in energy. And so we see that this would be an exothermic reaction. If we were going the other way, opposite way, and again, we could rewrite this reaction where we said, okay, let's take the solid water and go to the liquid water. And if we did that, our delta H over here would be the exact same number, but it'd be a positive 6.03 kilojoules instead of a negative 6.03 kilojoules. Then um, you could simply state the change in energy as a potential energy diagram, often referred to as a PE diagram, um, potential energy. And this is where you're drawing the potential energy on the y-axis and the progress of the reaction, not quite time, but sort of what you started with and then what you ended as. Um, so the progress of the reaction on the x-axis, and then your delta H would be represented visually by this graphic here. And again, if it's an exothermic reaction, we see that that energy of the system is going from what it was higher to what it is now lower. Or if it is an endothermic, it is taking in energy and we end up with a positive delta H in the endothermic case, and in this case, it would be a negative delta H on an exothermic reaction. Then this is the, uh, the, the harder one to, to go over all the details of, and again, it seems on the surface to be pretty straightforward, but then we need to make sure that we're keeping it clear um, when we go through all the different scenarios in which it shows up. But the idea of molar enthalpy um, is very useful in that you can actually say for a particular quantity, and of course in chemistry, the particular quantity we're talking about would be the mole. This is how much energy would be associated with the change. But there's a couple of things you gotta keep straight when you're using this. And this is a very common way because you can very quickly compare um, different types of changes for the same amount of stuff, one mole of the stuff. Um, but there's some things you need to keep track of or be sure of when you're using molar enthalpy. And it's not always explicitly stated, so you need to know that it is there and being represented when you're using these molar enthalpy values. So we'll go through some different scenarios with that. So molar enthalpy, um, first off, these are the three things that you have to be aware of. And again, they're not explicitly written down in a sentence for each value, but when they're given as a value, you need to know that these are the cases. First one, obvious one, is that 
docking molar enthalpy here. So this is referring to one mole, which seems pretty straightforward. But when it's applied to reactions, as we'll see at the end, um, a reaction could have various mole ratios within it. So you have to be aware of which ones it would be applying to in the molar context, which is what which other ones it may not be. So fairly straightforward, um, except for in some cases, you, you do need to be sure you're aware of which one you're referring to. Then. It's, again, kind of saying the same idea, but it has to be for a specific substance. It can't just be for um, anything. It has to be for a specific substance. And B, it has to be going under, undergoing a specific change. And so one mole of something in specific, some specific thing, that is going through a specific change. And we'll see some examples of this now. So to... Make sure we fully understand this. We're going to use this as an analogy um, with a sort of everyday process. And so imagine you are going to purchase a dozen chicken eggs and imagine they cost $3. That'd be great. Um, so really, we could think of this process of you going from taking the eggs at the store to take them to your house and that costing you $3. We could sort of write that up as a chemical reaction type thing where you have the 12 eggs and they are in a state which is at the store. And then you're going to change the state of which they are being. And those 12 eggs now are going to be at your home. And to do this particular change of state to take those eggs from the store to your house, there's a cost associated with that $3. So it's very similar to how we could see a thermochemical equation where you have a particular substance which then changes in some way. And there's a cost involved energetically to do that change. So first off, think of how this may be changed or think of what's implied in this actual written process here. First off is that um, if we weren't talking about 12 eggs, in this case here, we're talking about a dozen eggs at the store, so 12 eggs, but you could talk about any quantity you want, or at least figure out the price it would cost you to bring home any quantity you want, but you'd have to apply a molar ratio to that. So for example, if you decided you wanted 24 eggs, then obviously the energy change associated with that would be different. It'd be twice the amount of energy to do twice the amount of the same change with those eggs. If you weren't talking about chicken eggs, the price would be different as well. So in the, the equation, we, we say 12 eggs here, um, and it depends on what type of eggs you're talking about. Um, so if they were like 12 Fab Fabergé eggs, and they were at a store, and you wanted to take those 12 Fabergé eggs home, then that would have a different energy value associated with it. So it is important that you know which specific substance you're talking about. And some of them may look similar. And so, I mean, an egg and an egg, right? Um, but with a, uh, so for example, a diatomic molecule is different than two of the same atoms that make it up. So like a, a hydrogen gas molecule, H2, is different than two hydrogen atoms. And so if you do something with a hydrogen gas molecule versus do something with two hydrogen atoms, that is a different process. You have to be very careful with which process you're dealing with when you're doing these uh, thermochemical equations, especially later when we're doing Hess's law. And if you're dealing with something different, you have to realize that the cost itself is going to be different as well. If you weren't talking about taking them home, the price would be different as well. So the, the, the amount that you're dealing with, the type of substance that you're dealing with, and the change itself. So if you had 12 eggs at the store and you want to take them instead of to your house to a space station, then of course that's a different change. And so you have to be very careful. And this is why we use those little subjects of sub um, scripts of the states themselves, because if they are different, um, again, it doesn't seem terribly obvious sometimes, but if the change itself is not the same, then the energy associated with doing that change will also not be the same. Even though you're talking about the same amount of the same thing, it's a different change, it has a different cost. So let's apply this to a chemical reaction. So to vaporize one mole of water, 40 kilojoules-ish. So we could write that up as a thermochemical equation with the energy term written afterwards. Um, it is an endothermic reaction. It's taking in energy to turn that liquid into a gas. And therefore, it is taking in 40 kilojoules of energy. If you weren't talking about one mole of water, then the price would be different. So say you're talking about, oh, I want to vaporize two moles of water. Then, of course, just a simple mole ratio will tell you the new cost associated with that change. If you weren't talking about water... Also, the price would be different. So to take hydrogen peroxide and turn it into a gas, that's a different substance. So that will have a different cost associated with it. And if you weren't talking about vaporizing, if you're talking about doing something else with it, if the change was different, if you're taking that liquid and turn it into a solid, then of course the cost is also going to be different. So three things you have to be aware of that are not always explicitly stated when given a molar enthalpy value is 
the amount of stuff that you're dealing with. And, and generally, that's pretty straightforward with a mole. If it's just given to you, here's a mole. This is what it's going to cost to do what you want to do with it. But then you need to be aware of which substance you're talking about. Make sure it, it matches the one that you're looking for. Um, if you're starting with liquid water, then you don't want to use an enthalpy change that would involve starting with like gaseous water. And um, the change itself is going to be important because depending on what you're doing, there's going to be always a different energy cost associated with doing that change. So know how much you have, what you have, and what you plan on doing with it in order to use these molar enthalpies effectively. Then, um, just as an example of some of the changes that we can see there, so given the molar enthalpy, and because there's so many different types of changes that you can do, again, we'd be referring to one mole of the substance doing this change, um, but often just a subscript of X is then going to be replaced with some sort of subscript that describes the change itself, and there's generally standard ones that you'd be using, but um, for example, combustion, we could just write as a short form, and that would be an exothermic change because you're starting with your reactants and you're getting some products and in the process it's going to release heat so we know that that is going to be an exothermic change a negative delta h vaporization as we mentioned earlier you're taking in um, a, a liquid water that's in the pot here and you're turning it into well, that's uh, that's condensation um, so we know that the, that's already condensed again but it was a liquid and then it turned into vapor there's a water vapor there um, and then it's turning back into condensation here once it's lost a little bit of energy away from the pot um, but the process of vaporization itself where it's going from the liquid to the gas that is right here so liquids in the pot and then right there is the individual gas molecules and so that would be an endothermic change as well that's going to take a lot of energy to get them to go into the gas state which they can then come back down into their liquid state in just really small droplets and we see that as steam. All right, um, so heat of solution is what this is referred to. And again, as enthalpy is often referred to as, as the heat of something. And so heat of solution, this is where you are taking a solid crystal and turning it into free little ions, um, if, if it's an ionic substance, but you could have the same thing for other types of substances dissolving, but the heat of solution is involved, the energy change for that, and it could be either one. It really depends on what crystal you're dealing with. When you have the crystal, it's going to be attached together, and then you have your, let's say water, in this case if you're dissolving in water, uh, but your solvent in any case. If you want to get them to mix together, you've got to separate the water, so that takes some energy. You've got to break up the crystal, that takes some energy, and so if you looked at the energy that went into that process versus when those let's call them ions from the solid, but if it was an ionic compound and the water molecules, if it was dissolving water, then when they combine, they're going to have attractive forces. So that's going to give off some energy. So basically you have some uh, input of energy and then you have some output of energy. And if you get more out than you put in, then obviously it's going to be an exothermic reaction. But if it takes more energy to break up the crystal and separate the water, then energy involved in getting out when those water and, ion come, and ions come back together, then that will end up being an endothermic. You've put in more energy than you've gotten out. So depending on which crystal you're dealing with, then the heat of solution right here is going to be different. But as you can see, there are some that are going to be exothermic and there's some, some, some that are going to be endothermic depending on what the crystal is, um, how big those ions are and, and what um, how well they interact with that water and the energy released uh, when they start forming those attractive inter inter um, molecular forces then we have uh, enthalpy of freezing so pretty straightforward if you have um, liquid water and it goes down to ice then it would be an exothermic reaction which is sort of counterintuitive when you wouldn't think of something freezing as giving off energy but of course if it started with lots of energy and now it has less then the only way to do that would be to give off energy that's why the back of your freezer is warm then we have melting which unfortunately is called fusion here um, so the the enthalpy of fusion is referring to um, the opposite of freezing again same energy value associated with that but it would be moving in the opposite direction so again if you're talking about ice turning to liquid water that would be an input of energy so that would of course have to be an endothermic change and if we we're talking about one mole of water freezing versus melting um, then the 
energy value associated with that change would be the same, but it's just a matter of whether you are putting the energy in when you're melting it, or if we saw in the last case, where you're, where you're putting the taking the energy out, you'd be freezing it. Then we have heat of formation, and we have a whole bunch of stuff to learn about that later. Um, but essentially, this is making a substance from its component parts in their standard states. More on that in another video. So delta H, just a quick recap, is positive if it's endothermic, and it is negative if it is exothermic. It is taking in energy if it's going through an endothermic change, the system, and it is giving out energy if it is going through a exothermic change. So one last point that we want to make is that when we're talking about molar enthalpy, again, we have to have a particular substance and it has to be going through a particular change. And if we're talking molar enthalpy, we know we're dealing with one mole of the substance. So if we had water, we know that the heat of vaporization, that particular change itself would have a particular energy associated with it. Freezing would have a different, even though it's the same substance, even though it could still be one mole, that's a different change. It's going to have a different energy value associated with it nice thing with moles is that you can quickly apply mole ratios so if you said okay i want to do this with two moles of water then you say okay well one mole takes 40.8 so two moles will take twice that just a quick mole ratio and essentially what we're doing is we're applying this generic formula here where we're saying okay i know i have a molar enthalpy and what i can do is if i have a certain amount in this case two moles i can say okay well what will the specific enthalpy be for that specific amount of moles and obviously if you take the moles that you're dealing with in a particular circumstance, multiply it by the nice standard given molar enthalpy for that particular change, then you'll end up with the enthalpy for that particular situation that you're looking into. So again, um, molar enthalpies are sort of like a given value for a particular change of a particular substance, and it's one mole of that substance. All right, last point we want to make is that when you see them in a reaction, so molar enthalpies in reaction can get a little confusing in that we just talked about a molar enthalpy being a value for one mole of a substance going through a particular change. Now, obviously, a reaction is telling you what the change is. The problem is there's more than one substance within that reaction. So when you have your enthalpy value given, often it can be confused as well. Is this the molar enthalpy? And it kind of is, and it kind of isn't. It depends on who you're talking about. So for this particular change here, and again, we could say, okay, well, that's methane reacting with oxygen, giving carbon dioxide and water. So that, that's a combustion reaction. Um, so if we were to say, okay, for this combustion reaction, that is the specific change. This is the amount of energy that's given off per mole of methane, only because the coefficient in front of methane is one. If that was anything else, then this met value here would not be per mole. So because the coefficient here is one, then this value that is given for that particular reaction is going to be per mole of methane. So if you're talking about methane, you can use its coefficient. It happens to be one the way this is written here. Now, if this was balanced, if it's another combustion reaction and you had to balance it with another coefficient, then obviously this would not be per mole. But because it is one mole of methane, then this is per mole of methane. But if you were to talk about the oxygen, exact same process, exact same energy being produced, but obviously we're not using one mole of oxygen to do this. We're using two moles. So if you were to refer it or put it in the reference of, is this negative 882 kilojoules? Is it per mole of oxygen? And well, no, of course not. There's two moles of oxygen to do this reaction. So if I wanted to state, what is the molar enthalpy for the combustion of oxygen um, with methane, then I have to divide this whole equation by two, including, and it's an equation, so you can just divide the um, molar enthalpy by, or sorry, the enthalpy by two to get the molar enthalpy value for oxygen. But if we're talking methane, it's already in terms of one mole of methane. So this value right here technically is per one mole of methane.